away with today with the lowest stealth possible. Oh my gosh. She's a hobbit. She's a halfling. And um, if she had a god in D&D, what would it be? I mean, like, in Skyrim, that'd be Nocturna. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Mask if it would be from the D&D and Faerun setting. Yeah. To be honest, I mean, it's nothing. I didn't even know there however, were. I mean, I however, in, think, Path, I know there were in Pathfinder, I think she'd be a follower of, um, uh, oh, Caden Khalid. Did I say that right? I like that name. Okay, so in Pathfinder, this is the man god who decided to get rip-roaring drunk. Okay, I'm not kidding. <laughs> and decide to go touch the godstone. Now, the whole the whole idea behind this godstone is if you can get to it, which is like in the middle of the biggest, bestest city, Absalon, in this world, um, and you go and touch the godstone, you ascend. He is the only one to have ascended. And he does not remember it. And he is the god of like parties. And drunks and just He's all around. Oh my god. Like yeah. Or Bacchus. Yes. Yes. Very much so. Which, oh I mean, god. if oh you're god. gonna, if you're gonna create a religion and create a god or become a god, why not do it when you're absolutely shit faced? Might as well. I mean, if I was a god, I'd probably just be shit-faced or high of my ass the entire time. And I probably wouldn't give two fucks about shit that happens. See, now I kind of understand why gods do what they do half the time in stories. It's like, I probably wouldn't give yeah. that much of a fuck. If I lived forever, I probably would be sick of shit half the time. Well, Welcome like... to the Norse so... pantheon. <laughs> that is true. Fuck it. I, okay. so, right. Let's have a horse. Brett, he was like, well, if I die, then I'm just going to go to Valhalla, right? And I said, no, it doesn't work that way. Brett is coming around to the Norse pantheon, okay? Again, he does not consider himself a practitioner. He does not consider himself walking a path, even though he will go out of his way and find me reagents. That's not him. However, we started watching Vikings. <laughs> now he wants to be called Brett Bretterson. <laughs> And he asked if he would go to Valhalla if he died due to COVID. And I had to tell him, no, the Valkyries would not Redderson. find him on doesn't... the battlefield because he did not die with a knife in his hand. Didn't that, doesn't that translate to Brett, son of Brett? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's his dad's name then? We just got to call him that. Vance. Oh my god, Vanson. Vanson. I said, no, you would be Brett Vanson. And he said, and no. And that sounds pretty good. Actually. He said, no, he will be known as Brett Butterson. He wants to be. All right, Brutterson. Like I just always was. Raw Brett's or something. So <laughs> he wants the line to start with him. I'm not kidding, guys. I'm not. <laughs> I am Brett, son of Brett. Oh, your dad's name was Brett? No, his name was Vance. <laughs> <laughs> I was born from the soil. I have no father. He was born from the brew. Have you seen my husband? Yeah, he just came from the vat. Just, just, I just a him. vat of of beer. <laughs> he just rose. He just came up drinking. Just, just. <laughs> He is my dad bod Thor. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, I'm thinking about it like <clears throat> being Mormon, you can't drink. Like, you just, you can't. Now, I know my parents got around it by, um, I guess, I don't know. I've never actually looked this up. I don't know if it's in Doctrine and Covenants whatever but they got around it and started selling bottles that the brew was in at sca events because they made it themselves and apparently somewhere in the scripture said that you know they couldn't drink alcohol or mead brews whatever if it was made by someone else but they could if it was made by themselves so they started brewing wine and mead and stuff like this and still were mormon I was also to understand they can't have caffeine because, 
So are we are we broadcasting now or? Yeah. Oh, we are okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> other dogs. With their caffeine. A lot of them can't drink sodas. They can't drink coffee. They can't drink a uh, certain tea. Um, because I had a coworker when I was working back in Sears, and I, I rode with all the time, but he was allowed to drink Pepsi, and I couldn't figure that out for the life of me. And I he didn't really understand. You know, I. I Knew it was the caffeine that was the issue, but he claimed that there were other things in the coffee and tea. Like there was tannin in them, which is a little yeah. weird to me. I'm like, I don't think they put tannin in coffee. It's well, it's so tannins is a it's a natural product of the of of the process. It's a it's a tannins are. I'm gonna ask the scientist. Tannins, those are the the. Oh, that's one of my buttons. What is one of my buttons? Thank you, husband. Um. Tannins are are a natural chemical in something like tannins are in wine. Um, there is, if I remember correctly, tannins in coffee and tea, and it's not the caffeine that we can't have <clears throat> because then we couldn't have chocolate. Have you ever tried to take chocolate away from a pregnant Mormon woman? <laughs> no. But no, I didn't know that about no. that. I thought tannin was a human creation. I thought that was something that was kind of used specifically for tanning uh in um in no. i i have fish i have a fish tank and with uh i wanted to put manzanita in my tank and you have to like leach out the tannins if that we're talking mm -hmm. about the same thing then yeah yes. you have to like soak the wood so otherwise some people will say it's not harmful to fish some people say it is some people say it will just cloudy your water because it will like leach out a lot of the color but you have to usually waterlog a lot of the wood anyway for it to stay so, on the bottom so it'll come out and it'll i remember when i was doing it with the wood the water was just like all this dark color and after a while it was also kind of red but after a while it stopped leaching out and so it's usually in a lot of like i, I think colored like wood that's usually got a dark color but that's just what i've been told so i'm not 100 percent sure on that so is uh, it actually the tannins that the mormons that. can't have is that what's going on with that or Honestly, I've never actually looked into it when um I was still practicing it was just easier to say no soda. Um which I mean is is kind of a good thing to stay away from anyways cuz all of the the sugar content, high fructose and natural sugars. Um we couldn't have coffee, uh but we could have something called postum. Um postum, oh my gosh. What's postum? <laughs> it's like an instant hot drink. Um, it's very reminiscent of coffee, but I remember like my mom, like it, it comes in like crystallized form, kind of like, um, freeze dried coffee. Uh, my oh, mom would put okay. it on like ice cream and it was really, really yummy, but you, you would just basically put hot water with it and it would, you know, my aunt brought me some of that back, I think from Bali and it was like in a crystallized form and I was like in a packet. Yeah, I see it in a packet. Usually it's in a jar. It's like a blue and white jar. Very old fashioned, mm. looking like from the 70s. Um, so you could have that. Uh, you could have near beer, you know, non alcoholic beer. Um, let's see, uh, like if we went to a fast food place, and this is something that I still kind of, kind of do. Like I don't drink a lot of soda. I still don't drink a lot of soda. Thus, our sponsor today, the Arizona Watermelon. Is that our sponsor? No. <laughs> they ain't giving us no money. Not at 99 cents a can. Um, you know, going to the, the fast food, I will get probably like a manzanita soda, which is like sparkling apple juice, if I'm really honest. Um, uh, or lemonade, pink lemonade, stuff like that. Uh, I do drink sweet tea or iced tea, but for the longest time, I didn't. Um, hmm. I don't drink coffee. I mean, I, every once in a while, I'll get a Dutch Brothers um, because Flint still doesn't have water and I don't support Nestle. And uh, I mean, those are just holdovers from when I was a practicing Mormon. Um, but I mean, it, it, it's more like uh, the, the idea behind it is we don't allow stimulants to cloud our, our moral thinking. And when you're jacked up on caffeine, like, you, you can do some pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> I remember going hog wild on coffee after leaving the church. I was, like, probably 20 years old. And there was a coffee group at the office I was working in. Oh, my gosh. 
five dollars for the month's worth of coffee. Whatever you wanted, you could have all the coffee you wanted. This is before I realized I was soy intolerant. Um, but I would drink so much coffee that it suppressed my appetite, so I'd just drink more coffee. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. And then I realized I couldn't type anymore because my fingers were so jittery. You see, I feel like every single youth group and just um, church that I've been to had a coffee place, like a coffee bar inside. Almost every single one had Really? One. Yeah. So I grew up, my parents were Presbyterian, um, but I've been to a lot of um, Catholic and Christian and Presbyterian, specifically like churches. Um, a lot of my friends, their churches were just, they just said they were Christian. And then my great aunt was Catholic. So, but every single one had coffee, a coffee place. And one even had a Starbucks. And that's, that's no, actually that's... around here. So it was like. It's mainly because every other denomination of Except for the Mormons, coffee is the elixir of life. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of coffee. <laughs> but y'all don't have magic underwear <laughs> either, so. Well, but we have vestments, so. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Temple, temple vestments, magic underwear. You wear them under your clothes, and they're like, supposed to protect you. They have magic wafers and grape juice. They hand out and. And little um, pine leaves that I got in my eye once. That was my experience at my aunt's church. It was, pine leaves? Yeah, they, like, flicked the holy water at you with a giant pine branch. And, like, the pine needles would fly off. Or it wasn't pine, think... but it was, like, fur or something. I don't know. It was, like, I don't know. It was, like, a, a... they flung that at you. They were, like, Ugh, and this was very Catholics? aggressive. Yes. This is very aggressive. It kind of and... feels like that's, a, that's not really like an actual tradition of theirs, and they just wanted to hit kids with pine needles. I think they did. Well, they were doing it to everyone. It was kids, adults, because I was like, a, I was like a, a teenager, and man, they were just flinging it this way and that, and either I got a piece of the plant in my eye, or that water was not water, and or maybe it, it was holy was water it. and just burned me, you know. Because you're evil. Uh, it's because I'm evil. Like it got, oh man, it hurt. And I and then the, they handed out, you know, the wafers and everything. Like, and I was used to getting that because a lot of places that my aunt took me got that. But this was different. That I never had had the branch thing. But that was just weird. It was just right in the face. But oh all we got was saltines and juicy juice. Yeah, saltines. <laughs> See, I couldn't remember what the little wafer crackers were called. They weren't wafers, but. Saltines, jeez, there we go. Yeah, Saltines those, and grape like juice. Communion. Enjoy. So yeah, there you go. Believe it or not, Mormons have a communion, but it's water and it's Wonder Bread. <laughs> I'm not kidding. My younger oh. brothers love going to church for the little pieces of bread and water, and my mom was like, "Hey, if it'll make you go to church." Oh my gosh. Making me this carbohydrates. <laughs> You know, maybe that's why we're not Mormon. My mother hates Wonder Bread. <laughs> it probably wasn't Wonder Bread because the uh, the LDS Church actually has a, a very large infrastructure um, planning for the end of days uh, called Deseret Foods, and they actually grow, harvest, and then make all of their own uh, uh, food closet items. Yeah. It's massive. The, you can you can go down the highway. I think it's over there near Marysville, and you'll see like Deseret Farms. It's all LDS owned property. It's owned by the church. They're orchards, fruit um orchards of fruit trees, and they have beehives, of course. Um, There's also the big, they, huge um, secondhand furniture st store in Sacramento off of Auburn. Yes. That's yes. run by Deseret as well. Yes. Uh, uh, so there are. I'm glad I'm glad you actually were talking about Wonder Bread because it's probably not Wonder Bread. It's probably their own brand of Wonder Bread or their own brand of bread. Um, uh, but you there. One of the things that I miss probably most about the LDS community is that it's just that it's a community. And this was actually brought up by somebody at work. We were talking about in preparation for this week, um, talking about how. Uh, you know, like you go to church 
and you you feel included because of the community everybody's there for a common purpose and in that one moment all of everything aligns like nothing else matters everybody wants the same thing they all want to believe in their god they all want to practice whatever um everything is aligned and you just you everybody feels whole in that moment and i think that's probably something i even struggle with now even though i'm very comfortable in my in my path i still miss like that sense of community I, I I didn't stay with the church very long after my baptism. Um, but w- what I remember, like all of the women getting together and doing relief society and 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 helping out our neighbors, like I miss that. I, I think that's something that the LDS church actually excels at is they they do try to lend out a hand. Of course, that hand is hiding other things, but yeah, that's that is something that I miss. I miss that was that was the whole sole purpose of the church when I was commanded to start it was the church was to be a fellowship or a gathering mm-hmm. of the like minds and for those people who needed that fellowship to help them in their faith. That changed really quickly. But you know, that's it's with the with the you know, the, the small churches, the little working with Protestant churches. You still can get that feeling. It's just when you get into the bigger churches, the big ones, you know, like the ones that are in the United States. Yeah, this is all about the money. <laughs> yeah. So let's do a, a quick round robin and, and then we'll just say basically what we grew up with and where we're at now. Because I think that's it. Now that we've been talking about it for a, a moment, I think it's it's important for us to actually start state where we started and where we're at so that those who have popped in are actually watching know what we're talking about so kayla why don't you go first wow you started it. you go first i see how it is you started you brought it up okay fine so i started (laughs) um i started as a mormon um i was baptized at the age of 11 I've glitched out. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, there we go. Everybody caught up. Um, so uh, I started as a, a Mormon, uh, got baptized about the age of 11. Um, and then I left the church very quickly after that, probably 12. It helped that we moved away from our ward and um, the family just didn't reconnect. Um, and now I am... A practicing pagan. I am a, a follower of uh, the dark goddess herself, and my path tends to be more along the Western European, Celtic, mostly Irish traditions. All right, I'll go now yeah. if you'd like. That's fine. And of course, I've dabbled in things like you know Baptist and Catholicism because my grandparents. So. Oh uh, well, my parents—they uh, weren't super strict on religion, but they—they they grew up Presbyterian, so they wanted me to grow up Presbyterian at least, experience church. Um, but I didn't really go a lot. But probably, I went when I was really young a few times, and then we didn't really go probably from when I was like maybe eight, like probably eight. It was before fifth grade. Um, we stopped really going, and then around because. My grandma actually passed my dad's mom, and I think that might have been the catalyst. For some reason, we stopped playing for a while. And then when I was in high school, um, I started going to youth group more, and it was a Christian youth group. And I had gone to, with my aunt to her church a couple times, but this was, I had never gone to a youth group. So my dad was like, um, I want you to go to youth group. And I said, okay, well, this one youth group is going to Great America can I go to the theme park? And he's like, yeah, I'll let you go to the theme park, but you have to continuously go for at least a year. And that turned into a couple of years and a few more years. So I did participate in this youth group a lot, but I always felt like I was an imposter there because I didn't necessarily feel like I fit. And I never really believed in it in that particular line of faith. It just didn't, it didn't fit me. So then I was a lot more, I started experimenting more near like, 
I don't know exact how old I was, but I was like looking into other faiths and everything. And I did find paganism through, I think believe, I believed through Tumblr or technically it was Wiccan. I found the Wiccan faith through Tumblr. And then I started ordering, I ordered a book and then I started to read more off of Tumblr. And then I at first called myself a Wiccan, but then I realized I wasn't really a Wiccan. I followed more of like the Western European like Irish faiths because I also am adopted, but I found out through my birth mother that I was more Irish. So I was like, oh, I'm, I want to go look into more of like where I'm from and everything. And I, I got more into the more Western European Celtic, I guess, outlook on things. Um, and I haven't really found more of like, I guess, a path yet because I'm still researching a lot of deities and I'm very skeptical about being like, I'm going to believe in this deity right now. And I believe they're there. So I don't feel like I want to worship yet or anything until I found that. So I necessarily, I don't think I've found my path yet. I'm still looking for it. But I still tend to follow more of the Celtic path. So I'm not a Christian anymore. Sorry, I talked for a while. <laughs> I'll go next. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up Southern Baptist. As I grew into my teen years, I was a huge Christian. I read every And then I read the Mystic Travel. I that regardless of controversy surrounding a lot of um, those books, the series of books, was my As I got older, I started reading more on what I could get my hands on, stuff like that. that I have. <laughs> um, yeah, my wife is saying that the audio is cutting out. Um, in, oh, no. So, uh, yeah, Marion's and Bradley was my intro into the Celtic faith. Um, as I got older, I started reading more on Celtic. Um, mysticism or naturalist style stuff. Got into Waldo, um, Emerson, and Thoreau. Started reading up on transcendentalism, stuff like that. Um, now, you know, my, my brother introduced me to Hermetics and Thelema, and that's pretty much the path that I'm on now. Um, I subscribe to a book called The Celtic Golden Dawn, which is a mixture of of Celtic spiritualism with the hermetic ideals of Christianity. Well, I um, I had become a Christian when I was around four, I want to say, because we had just recently moved into a new house. Um, my dad had just kind of found his faith then and basically had talked to myself and my brother. My brother was still a little too young to really comprehend it um, but for the most part we were raised up Christian Baptist uh, for a while and we had actually gone to different churches in the area now I, I grew up in Galt and uh, at the time it was a really small little town so you didn't have much option for what churches to go to a lot of them kind of shared the same uh, ideals um, but we had to keep kind of hopping around them and um, my mom was having some issues agreeing with some of the stuff because they kind of had the whole staunch viewpoint of you know women should be seen and not heard. They should be not working. They should be raising the kids. And she, she had issues with that. She had issues with uh, the way the homeschooling groups were trying to teach her how to teach us. And, you know, they would look at stuff like my, my brothers and I took an interest in natural stuff. We took an interest in biology of animals and we'd start looking at the stuff like genus, which opened up the doors for evolution. And of course, you know, that was a big no, no for any of the churches. Um, I pretty much stayed Christian for a while, though, I didn't really examine those beliefs until around 22, I had kind of a, a, a personal crisis. Um, 
And only then did I start to really examine those and try to figure out why it was that I was Christian, why I believed that way. And, you know, one of the things that kind of held me at bay with that was the whole fear that is instilled to use you as a child, that there could be a hell. And if you stray from that path, you're going there. And even not going to church, because I, I was not going to church after, you know, I got into the military service. I, I, was, I had my Sundays to myself. Even that, not having that reinforced was still something that sat in the back of my head for a very long time. And you know, after 22 and kind of from then on forward, I, I kept reexamining each thing that I was feeling about the faith until I finally came to where I am, where it's just, I'm agnostic. I don't believe the Bible is accurate anymore. I don't follow it. Um, I believe it was something that was written by men to try to understand God. But there's a lot of stuff in it that I, I can't agree with anymore. I think that there's probably some good messages in there, but it's mixed with a lot of not so good messages too. Um, so that's where I'm sitting right now as a post-Christian agnostic. And so, I, I kind of tend to stay that way. Sorry about that. I was going to ask, um, because I've heard the term, and, and this just might be my uh, ignorance. What is the difference between agnostic and atheist then? Because I think, I mean, I know one is supposedly not believing in God and the other one's not believing in in anything. But I mean, like, is that really what it is? Or because I, I've, that's not a concept that I've ever been able to wrap my brain around, to be perfectly each honest. Of, each of those classifications, agnostic and atheist, they have multiple possible definitions depending on the person in question. But atheist specifically denies the existence of God. Um, they don't believe a God exists. They believe that the universe is as it was, that nothing created it, that it just simply is. And uh, they tend to follow immediately the Big Bang Theory, um, which, which everything kind of points to that if you look at science. Um, agnosticism, it, it literally translates to um, without knowledge. And the idea is that we're basically someone like myself would say, I don't know if there is a creator or not. I will not deny the possibility that one exists, but I don't personally think that it can be proven. And I believe that for multiple reasons. Um, I think one, it can't be proven because it's something of the spiritual nature and you can't prove spiritual things with physical evidence. It's just not a possible thing for us to prove by science. It doesn't mean that one doesn't exist, but it simply means that it just can't be proven to. And then and I looked at a lot of, uh, what the Bible had to say about God's existence, which is do not tempt the Lord your God, you know, because people would ask him to prove his existence. And he said, don't tempt me. I'm not going to prove I exist. You know, kind of fuck you. I'm going to go ahead and keep doing what I want. And I'm not going to uh, cater to you, your demands. So the way I see it is that even as, uh, and I've seen a lot of Christians that try to prove the existence of God. And they always point to a bunch of different things and say, see, this is proof of his existence. Like you can't prove he exists. He doesn't want to prove that he exists. <laughs> Who are you to deny a de de deity that y you can't. So even if he does exist, you can't prove it because he refuses to accept proof. He refuses to prove his existence. And if he does exist, you know, that, that's that rule right there. If he doesn't, then you still can't prove he exists because then he doesn't. <laughs> So as an agnostic, I, I take it from a different perspective that I, I consider God to be sort of independent if he exists, that he created things to be set in motion. And then it was like, all right, you guys have your fun, you know, with your existence and good luck. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm have immediately fun. reminded of the story of the babblefish. I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <nerd laughs> showing, but <laughs> the babblefish springs to mind. <laughs> that was that was always a good one. I loved that one. That was a, a wonderful uh, use of logic by Douglas Adams. It was. It really is. Oh. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think uh, <laughs> probably what I am, because there's, there's multiple classifications, I'd say a theistic agnostic, which is that I think there's a possibility of a higher power, a higher creator. I don't think it's a Christian God. Um, I don't think that they're so focused on micromanaging us to tell us that this that's a sin that's a sin that's a sin to heaven because of this i think that more likely that if a creative power exists it probably created matter probably set things in motion to work the way they did with the universal laws and is just more interested in seeing how things turn out like any artist um i think that's a very good possibility i can't prove it i don't preach it but that's just my personal thoughts on uh on that 
Well, if you notice, we don't really preach on, on yeah. this podcast. We try very hard not to yeah. preach. Everybody's path is their own. Everybody's welcome to their own path. They're welcome to their own thoughts because beliefs are that. Like you can't you can't prove faith. You can't Yeah, I'm not gonna prove, be the one to stay here and be like your God's not real because I can't prove it. So I'm just I mean I'm gonna look like a real idiot if like I'm wrong and I mean if I'm right, what do I really gain? I mean, I lost a I, friend, maybe, but I I did want to let people know who are who are watching. We are going to be talking about specific deities and how you work with them and and worship and all all that kind of timey wimey jumbled wibbly stuff. wobbly. Yeah, the wibbly wobblies. Um, we're gonna talk about that later because oh, do we have some thoughts on those? I do have some thoughts on those. Even though I like, I am a follower of the Dark Queen. Um, uh, <laughs> no god is gonna talk to you I'm sorry you're gonna be that crazy person out on the street on a soapbox you know like the gods don't whisper in my ear They that's just not how gods work go check that, out TikTok for that, that crazy deity talk fun no, no shade towards that the TikTok don't. people I, I, I love it still but it the same all time. I'm saying, all I'm saying is if somebody took that person and slapped a different deity's name on them instead of, you know, Apollo talking to you, if somebody said Jesus Christ speaks to me in my ear every night and he says this and that, you'd look at that person and be like, you need to go see the psych ward. I've noticed a lot of those what people claiming priest? that tend to become pastors and preachers nowadays on national television. I still think they they need to see the psych ward. Oh yeah, I, you know, I agree I, wholeheartedly. This is a side note, but I've changed the channel on my TV many times. I barely use my TV because I have like streaming stuff, but I'm talking like cable TV. And whenever I do turn it on, usually for my nephews, it's always on some tele like the same televangelist whose name I cannot remember, but it's his his Texas. He's from Texas. And I don't know how it gets back to that channel. Really weird. But it's just Maybe God is on trying to talk yeah. to you, Kayla. Get <laughs> it's a sign. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And he's always very enthusiastic when he's talking I was gonna about say, donations. They're very enthusiastic when they're talking about money. Yeah. No, he's all always of them like, are. They're you always can donate. any of that. I think. One of my favorites was Robert Tilton, and that's specifically because of the emergence of the farting preacher videos, where they would insert uh, raspberry noises every time he'd sit there and stop for a second, look like he's really getting in touch with God, and then you hear. <laughs> I love those. I'm going to be watching that later. Robert oh, Tilton that was... is hilarious, and yes, he was a fraud. He was found to be uh, committing tax evasion and to have multi-million dollar houses, stuff like that, with all the money that flowed upward through his uh, faith centers. Um, but those videos are amusing. I'm going to watch those. Oh, that sounds good. So what actually like drew you guys away from your childhood faiths i'm actually really interested in that not just because you know we're, we're talking about that kind of stuff but from like a anthropological standpoint i mean people when when they're young there's a reason that there are faith groups and there's <coughs> sunday school it's because they like to they can, like to condition the children it's easier to accept the mystical when you're children which is why i think a lot of us find a new path in our teen years is because we're still trying to grasp that that mythical magical mystical type feeling that we had when we were children do you, we want to draw straws to see who goes first or no you go first you're the you're the guest you Oof. go first we'll do dudes uh, first Oof. this time well for me um at, at the time uh it's kind of important to understand what i was going through in my life at the time uh, i was about 22 i had just been dumped for the first time i was going through severe depression and I was in the service, so I was away from my family and friends back home. I didn't really know that many people. I'd only been in about three years. Uh, could not really get along with my coworkers. Wasn't really friends with any of them. I mean, I, they kind of called them friends, but it, it wasn't like friends, uh, people that, you know, was ride or die with. Um, what had happened was I had attempted suicide at about 22. And I had a real shaking of faith at that point because I was starting to wonder, you know, Am I going to be going to hell? You know, what's going to happen here? 
And I was wondering, you know, what is it that God has planned for me? Because you're told throughout church that God always has a plan. And it was really feeling like there was no actual plan in place. And I didn't like lose everything, but lose my faith and change my entire mindset right that minute. But that was the starting point. And over the course of the next several years of my life, I was starting to road away a lot at the, the, the brainwashing that had been done to me as a child to, uh, to that point where I was told not to question anything. And then I'd start looking at things. I'm like, well, this isn't okay. You know, this right here, why was this taught to me? You know, what, what exactly behind the people that wrote this part of the Bible? And I continued to change until I finally started to really just acknowledge that maybe the Bible is not, you know, it, it's not uh, an all knowing device. It's not written by some divine intelligence. It was written by men. And I started to recognize that there were certain parts of it that would have specifically benefited somebody who was selfish, who was greedy, who wanted power for themselves. And I started to really kind of look into a lot more of the history of, you know, when the whole concept of hell originated, which um, looking into it, I think that it mostly originated back in the Middle Ages when people were trying to get peasants to go to church and try to follow their religion and accept a specific king or a pope as their authority figure. Because if they didn't, then there was this pit of fire and brimstone. Uh, terror was a real thing back then they'd be used to keep people in check and keep them obedient. And they did the same thing with witch burnings and the Inquisition and all that kind of led to the same thing. It was a tool for power. And that, that that's kind of where I sat in when I finally understood what the Bible was and realized that, okay, I think maybe I'm not a Christian anymore. So it, for you, it was at a, a moment of crisis that you started examining things? Yes. Because I didn't really examine it too much before then. And it was only after that that I started to really look at it and try to figure out what was going on, uh, at least for me. Okay. Well, thank you. I want to say thank you very much for sharing that. I have posted in our comment section, um, just because you did say something about suicide, I did post the National Suicide Hotline for any of those who are actually having a crisis of faith, and um, especially during this very trying time that we're still living through. Please reach out, get some help. Um, I mean, it, if you need somebody to talk to, just talk to someone. There's always help. Um, always. Always, always. Uh, what about you, Cliff? Well, so I had some very similar experiences to Eric. Um, I was in the I, I, did, I was in the service as well. I was in the army. Um, but that had kind of the opposite effect on me. So if we, if we start out, so I started separating from. And we have to put this into context. I grew up during the Satanic. I remember that. And the fun time. I was getting I you know I played D and D. I listened to metal. You know, I love pretty much everything that my mother didn't do, and anything that she could do to get me to try to conform. I rebelled against. Um. Which made it, it, it they're, they're, my mother's not like that anymore, but at the time it, there was a, a very significant divide of what she wanted me to be as far as religion. Because, um, like I said, I was baptized. It wasn't, really wasn't, it wasn't going to be a And then growing up in the 90s when I finally when I left home moved to Kansas after high school, um, it was easier for me to not have that constant bombardment of you need to go to church, you need to do this, you need to do that. Um, so I, I was given more freedom to explore the path that I wanted to walk down. wasn't a great time in my life. I was very nomadic. Um, I was doing a lot of things that I was... I don't want to say I shouldn't have been doing, but I was doing them to an excess of that I shouldn't have been doing. So, 
a lot of a lot of heavy drug use here. Um, a lot of mind altering drug use to an extent that I shouldn't be doing that. It's kind of messed me up now. <clears throat> when I got married, when my wife got married. I joined the army for a short stint. I had a very short stint there. But when I was on base, I was on the army for six years. Um, everybody that I was there was Southern Bible Belt. Southern Bible Belt. So in order to connect, try and connect with them and not have that feeling of I'm all by myself, I started going back to church on base. Um, and started convincing myself that this was the right path. Pretty hardcore, actually. I go back and I read some of the letters that I wrote to my wife and I was like, yeah, I was really... I was kind of gaslighting myself, brainwashing myself back into Christianity. And then when I got discharged, because I had a, I um, have epilepsy, so I had a seizure. That's that's instant. I'm done. I'm an old adult. No good for me. Um, so when I finally came home, we started going back to church here here in Roseville, to, to the, the Independent Baptist Church that her mother. And we did it for a few months, and then I started coming, you know, the the programming started to go back away. I started coming back to the realizations of what am I doing? Why this is the all the all the things that I ran away from when I was younger, I'm seeing again and I want to run away. Because I had lost that connection. The chaplain on the base was a really super nice guy. I really liked him. He helped me through some, you know, some pretty stressful, stressful things. Um, and that, I think, was part of what led me to going back to church. But yeah, when I got out and we started going back to church, it basically all came crashing down. This, this isn't what I need to be doing. This isn't what I should be doing. Um, these people are not good for me. So I started looking um, more into hermetics, um, starting with Alex Cole, Leo, John Dietz, um, stuff, Hardy. And, and and some other stuff. Um, some of the names they're bigger names, but they're going to Um, but that's kind of where I am at this point. I'm comfortable in my spirituality now, or I'm more comfortable in my spirituality now than I have ever been. Mostly because I don't have any peers that are pushing my buttons going, you can't believe this, you have to do it this way. And that's, you know, I've always been one to succumb to that. I don't want to say that I'm being willed, but peer pressure is what it's like. Me too. So, uh, do you think, even though it was reprogramming and probably detrimental to your journey to your to your current path would you go back and if you could go back and still visit that chaplain and and attend that service while you were on base um you know i don't know to be honest so one of the things you have to you have to understand especially when you're in basic training you're very susceptible because they're in the process of breaking you down. Right. They're in the process of breaking you down to build you back up to be the soldier that they want you to be. And in that time period, you're very susceptible to 
well, suggestion, <laughs> to, to, for lack of a better, better, better term. Um, you know, and when you are surrounded by people that are all of the Christian persuasion of one bend or another, you know, it's it's very hard not to um, look at it and go, well, you know, I'm all alone. I really need to connect with these people. You know, you're you're being pushed into unit cohesion because of the way that the military works. The best way to do that is to connect with them religiously. Um, and, you know, every branch of the service has, you know, their mantra about God and country, especially, you know, it's, it's not as hardcore in the army as say like the Marine Corps, where it's God, country, core unit, but it's very similar. I grew up in a Marine home. My dad was a Marine, so I understand you know, that mantra very well. Um, you know, my dad was. Okay. Um, while, while we're in between, um, how about we introduce the furry things that were on the screen? Because... Oh, yeah. Where's that cat? Bring that cat What's back. The, what is your cat's name? <laughs> Bring that cat That's back. Tazzlehoff. That's who? What? Tazzlehoff. I, na- I named him after the Dragonlance character. So cute. Nice. That's awesome. He's also an asshole. for life. Oh, no. He's a cute <laughs> asshole, though. I, I call, he I call was him very sometimes. striking. Um, so, uh, Most those who are... Asshole. <laughs> so those who are actually familiar with Mysteries Mystical Cupboard, I hope you follow us on Instagram. Um, if so, you would have seen my asshole. Gross. He's now laying on my lap. I love it's when I mystery. get to see your asshole. Oh my gosh, this is so not PG-13. <laughs> my husband's talking about dirty mysteries looks. Mystery is the greatest asshole ever. He is the greatest asshole ever. There he, there he is. Oh, look at the little asshole. Little hairy he, asshole. He's actually kind of upset. On Wednesdays, I don't give him a mu- as much attention when I come home. Oh. So he's, if you see that little face. Oh, oh. By you. the way, he also knows what a camera is. God. <laughs> yeah. My asshole's too big to sit on my lap. <laughs> That's because yours is a dog. Well, yeah, he's, I, I have a, Eric, I have a 120 pound, well, close to 120 pound um, Malamute Husky mix. His name is Odin. You and should have... uh, make friends with Cliff on Facebook because he posts nothing but pictures of Torvi and Odin. <laughs> Torvi is my other, my other dog. She's a little 40 pound um, Irish wheat and Harrier. Um, all my oh, animals get Norse so names. So, you know. Or be meaning beloved of Thor and Odin. So, um, which, you know, surprising you would think of all the of the, the stuff that I, you know, I, I love Norse mythology and the Norse pantheon. I don't follow, I'm not Asa True, I don't follow the Norse pantheon <laughs> religiously. You know, I do have, you know, a bearded axe sitting here next to me on my desk. But, Ooh, know. that's nice. <laughs> well, that, that's understandable. I mean, I, I love, like, Greek mythology and I've studied a lot of it. Uh, growing up, and I don't follow it, but I just enjoy the, the mythological right. aspects of it. So, a- any sort of stories and myths like that always in- intrigue me. Yeah. Uh, they, all, I always loved reading about the Greek myths. They were my favorite growing up, but, but I never really followed are, it. If you are interested, and you want to read, and if you haven't read it yet, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology is amazing. Such a great book. Okay. Well, I. I, I Mostly followed, not really necessarily with that specific book, but with something similar, uh, American Gods. I yes. absolutely love that yes. book. And I've been watching the show, which has strayed from where the book was at. I do enjoy the show, but there's definitely some parts I'm like, okay, I don't know what they threw that in there, but that's okay. I'm okay you with know, it I because they Neil Gaiman remained actor, so. so much. He had so much creative control in the show. So I'm okay with the changes because I know he had some say in it. Yeah, the, the show definitely had some interesting stuff there. Um, it was really good. I do. I am sad that Orlando um, Jones left it because he made an excellent Nancy. Oh yeah, I know. I'm I'm very pissed off about that. I heard that he didn't leave it. I le- I heard he left under duress. He, I, I've heard that yeah. too. I've heard some mixed stuff on that one. Uh, from what I've seen of the show, it's actually very woke. So I'm not quite because sh- he he claimed that they fired him because of racist reasons. Which, 
from seeing where the show had gone with a lot of its messages, I don't quite follow that. So I think that maybe he might have been a difficult actor to work with, and that might have been part of what happened. <clears throat> but he did make an excellent Nancy, and I really wish that he would change his mind on that one. I wish that if there was differences that they might have been able to resolve them. Um, might have gotten too buried no in his... I know the last season they had Marilyn Manson in there briefly, and then they had to quickly write him out because of what had been happening with Marilyn Manson, which is sad. I like his music, but I can't, I can't like him anymore. Um, I thought he was a woke person. I thought he was a really decent person from a lot of his interviews. And then it turns out, no, he's not that great of a person. I always hate that. I know I'm not like, saying Down. torrent their music, but I am saying that's available. <laughs> It's it's like it's with how it is with a lot of actors and artists. You sit there and go like, well, at least this actor's. Oh no, they're bad too. What the hell? Uh, I like Morgan Freeman. Oh, it turns out Morgan Freeman's been sexually harassing people too. What the fuck? It's like everyone <laughs> is dirty in Hollywood. Whedon. Joss Whedon. Don't say it. We're gonna find something bad now about him. You oh, it's it. already done. It's already oh, done. Oh yeah, Joss. It is. Joss oh is a my bastard. God. <laughs> no, why would you say that? Why would you do this to me? I'm sorry. Guys, I try not to. I try. No, I'm hiding now. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. I no, know no. my love of Firefly. Okay. Almost all of the Buffy and Angel crew have come out against him. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. I, I think it's okay I, to I like. I saw it and I fell apart. But Damn. Like a, a lot of people love Michael Jackson's music still. I mean, his music is impressive, but there's a good chance he was a child molester. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We didn't play him at our wedding. I'm a, I was a huge Michael Jackson fan. I didn't play him at the wedding. No matter how many people wedding either. How many people wanted him on the playlist, I didn't put him. Yeah. Just... Anyways, just, uh... Kayla, you're up. All right, my turn. So back to we were talking about why we left our original paths of like basically like why I stopped being Christian. That yeah. kind of thing. Um well I'm gay. I'm actually pan, but that's the original thing is like, I was just like, everything is telling me that God says gays can't exist. And that was my first introduction really to it. And I was just like, I like men. I like women. I like everyone. I'm not going to change that. And so then I really started reading more into like the Bible and everything. Cause my dad told me, read it first, then come back. And after I started reading it, it still didn't vibe with me. And I just felt like it, a lot of it was like, as everyone said, it was written by man. A lot of it, like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Cause on one hand, a lot of people would be very welcoming and be like, Oh, lovey dovey. And then if they find one thing about you that like, for example, I liked girls, they'd be like, Oh, that's against the Bible. Yet they would go against a lot of things in the Bible. And it felt very contradicting to, for, to be part of that community for me. And so then I, I decided to leave and branch out. But I, as I said before, I wasn't really, really into it. My parents didn't make me go to church a lot. It was kind of, we went here and there and I went to youth group here and there. Um, but I always felt like I wasn't welcomed because of that. So I always kept that part of me secret from people because they'd always a lot of specifically the churches I went to were very against it. And that could have just been the churches I went to. And there's probably a lot of churches who are very welcoming of it. But that was my experience of like, if you're gay, you're going straight to hell. Bye bye into the flames. And so I was like, no, thank you. So I just left, I guess. And just pretended for a long time with my parents that like, Oh yeah, I'm Christian. I love God. Like I really made, like played it off to them as I really was a Christian. But then I recently came out to my mom and was like, "Nope. I'm going to I'm casting spells, mom. I'm a witch. Going to watch my podcast, mom." I even I told her she should she should watch it. But I think she's busy tonight anyway. She has the boys. Well, didn't <laughs> That's she a whole kind of chore. Didn't she kind of have an idea when we had like a Beltane barbecue? in her backyard i told her before that yeah i told her like a while ago before that but she really yeah, enjoyed the chaucers yeah. <laughs> oh yeah that stuff was good i enjoyed it man that was good but that was basically i wasn't super strict into it so like kind of like my breakup with christianity wasn't like it was kind of very gradual because i never really 
considered it a breakup because I wasn't really in it. I never really believed it, but it was, I don't know. That's how I saw it as. It was like, eh. I'm shedding my... What is it? Imposter? Yeah, I'm shedding the costume I was wearing. I'm taking off the cosplay for the whole weekend that was 20-whatever years. Throwing it off. It needs to go in the wash because I can't wear it for an entire weekend without washing it. All right. Uh, so, That's my story. So... I know, I know you are still researching, and, and I know we have discussed before that you feel more drawn to Western Celtic paths. Um, is, that, is that something that you're drawn to because of your craft, or is it something that you are gravitating towards because, you know... That's something that you and I have discussed for probably the last two years, almost two years now. Oh my gosh. Oh shit. Um, that's a good question. Um, I had been interested in it before actually I met you, but um, I'm trying to think of like what like probably sparked that. I don't know. I was not sound cliche, but it was like, I guess it's just yeah. more of like a feeling, you know, of like that just is what I, f- I felt like that's what I wanted to do. I have a very, um big inclination to study like greek mythology i love greek mythology and it's something i have read a lot of the stories and i was like reading about but it's not ever been something that i've been drawn to like i had with like celtic mythology and i barely researched anything and i felt like i needed to research more but actually dedicate actual time to it not just some like hobby and it just felt different to me on that point okay and just like kind of researching it i guess i don't know i'm trying to like put that feeling into words but i just can't you know it was really hard i'm like hmm i'm gonna have to come back to that next next week i'm just gonna just gonna pop in my head and i'll be like wait (laughs) Uh, (laughs) just so you know we do have another guest on wednesday on this coming wednesday for saint patrick's day we do have a new guest oh saint patrick's day i'm about to make a green drink i'm gonna have to make a green drink too Maybe I'll put a little green dye in my mead. Not that y'all see it when I drink out of this fancy new mug. I'm going to put a little drowning St. Patrick. Patrick. We're drowning St. Patrick. Oh my goodness. I was say, are We're you drowning him. Get to, to hear me go off on a tangent about St. Patrick? Isn't he a sure. piece of shit? I don't know if that. <laughs> then, I mean, kind you know, of. None of it can be proven. It's, it's, we have speculation on what St. Patrick did to the Irish and what he did to the, to the pagans. We, we, at this point, it's kind of mostly Well, Facebook mm-hmm. said it was true, so. Therefore, it's it, good enough for it me. must be true. It's, it's <laughs> yes, corroborated. Heck yeah. They haven't flagged I didn't even her. Have to read it must the article. be true. I just saw the headline. Must be true. Must be that facebook news i'm I'm waiting cliff like you've got me on pins and needles now oh you want me to do it now no i'll wait until next week to do it oh, we oh should, we should okay do it next yeah week. that should be we should we're, we're gonna have sit on day. we're gonna have sit on with us next week so that maybe maybe oh, we'll get right okay. into that well, conversation yeah. um oh okay so my turn um so Okay, the LDS, which, okay, (laughs) if y'all aren't on a Reddit and not looking up some of these weird subreddits like ex-Mormon, y'all should, okay? Um, Like, there is some weird stuff that you learn and you just accept as as a Mormon when you are raised Mormon. Um, So... Because I left when I was so, so quickly after, um, after my baptism, there were some things that I missed out on as a teenager. Like I had one dance. Yes. The Mormons have dances. They have dances for their youth. Uh, you have to be like 14 and you can go until you're like 17. Um, but basically it's like a meat market. You go to meet your husband kind of thing. Um, or 
actually girls wait until their mission. Uh, so when you're like 20, 18 to 20, you can go on a mission. You actually have to pay to be sent somewhere in the world for two years to help spread the word of the gospel. Um, I didn't get there. Not that I probably ever would have gone on a mission because my parents were poor. Uh, but I remember getting ready for my baptism and I don't remember being asked if I wanted to be baptized. I just remember being told you're getting ready for your baptism. You're going to have classes like twice a week by the missionaries. <sighs> and I had a crush on Elder Clausen. Oh my gosh. He was from Nebraska. <laughs> it was really cute. And I was 11, and I didn't know any better. And I was just like, hi. Clausen. Anyways, Elder Clausen, Sister Hunter had a uh, had a crush on you. Um, <laughs> Shout out. My face is all red. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, so I remember getting ready for my baptism. The weeks leading up to that, I remember the baptism itself. I remember after the baptism, the classes still continued because in um, in the church, the reason that you get baptized as a, at 11 is because that is like your bar mitzvah. You, you are now an adult. You no longer, sins no longer brushed off of you. You are now being held responsible celestially for your sins, so to speak. Um, it's now up to you to choose the right and to repent. And if you are repentant and you are good from that point forward, then you can get into the heavenly kingdom. Um, it wasn't long after that that I remember the bishop. Now, some terms. Bishop is basically the pastor. Um, they can get married, they can have kids, they're in good standing members of the church. They have the priesthood. Um, like, you don't ever want to get pulled into the bishop's office, let's just put it that way, okay? You don't want the bishop to come to your house. Uh, and they will, if you fuck up. They have come to my parents' house before. I was actually really embarrassed. I wasn't even part of the church anymore. I was like 23 and the bishop and some other elders come in and there's my stepdad with like underwear on only. And my dad was, my stepdad was like 450 pounds coming to talk about my little brother knocking up some little Mormon girl. Okay. And I'm <laughs> sitting there like, um, I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> I may not be in good standing with the church, but I am not prepared for this. I don't know these people no more. Um, yeah. Anywho. Um, I remember getting asked right after my baptism, because I was now an adult in the eyes of the church, uh, to give a, like a little sermon type thing, a little lesson. That's what they're called, lessons. A lesson to the youth about what my responsibility as a uh, as a as a baptized mormon girl should now be like going forward how i was going to conduct myself and all this kind of stuff um i also remember just after this and this was the thing that like kind of clicked in my mind um i remember my uncle coming to visit from Arizona. This is the first time my uncle had actually like come to our house in like my recent memory at the time. And I remember asking him how Uncle Ben was. And I remember him leaving and asking my mom if Uncle Ben was her brother as well. And she said, no, Uncle Ben was my Uncle Eric's partner. And I said, what does that mean? And she tried to explain as best as she could to an 11 year old who had absolutely no idea about what she was talking about, what that meant. And not long after that, was there a discussion 
during the service about the homosexual problem, as they put it. And I remember asking someone, you know, well, what's a homosexual? And realizing that my uncle fit into that that category. Now, at the time, I thought the world of my uncle. He was not often there. And when he was, he was very sweet. Like I had very fond memories of visiting him in Phoenix with my grandmother and my grandfather and him coming to Sacramento to visit. And like, he took me to the zoo and I remember him and I in a canoe on a pond and I was looking over the side and he was like, Chrissy, stop it. You're at Tim is over. And like, I had these great memories of my uncle and I remember the feeling of the bishop telling me that such persons were beyond redemption and were going to be cast into outer darkness. Now, outer darkness is worse than hell to a Mormon. That's where apostates go, those who can't be saved. And my 11-year-old brain couldn't comprehend why God and his infinite wisdom and love, because Mormons don't, they're not God-fearing. Mormons do not fear God. They don't fear, fear God. They don't fear his son, Jesus Christ. They don't feel, fear the Holy Spirit. You know, that's the, that's the, um, the Holy Trinity for Mormons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Not the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Spirit. It's a very important distinction. Um, I remember getting in that argument with my grand, my Catholic step grandmother. Oh my gosh, it's the Holy Ghost. No, it's the Holy Spirit. Grand. Yeah. Um, and I and I was thinking in my eleven year old brain that you know I did not want to continue with this idea that because somebody loves someone that they should not be with the rest of their family after they die because Mormons, they, they think of heaven um, differently. The celestial kingdom is not heaven as you, as you have known it in other scripture. It's, you know, you, you, you get sealed with your family. When you die, your family is going to be with you celestially. You, you each get your own planet, you know? I, I know that sounds weird, but that's that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, and hell isn't fire and damnation. It's actually cold and it's removed. And and I, I couldn't think that this wonderful person who had, I had such fond memories with was going to be removed from me in the next aspect of my my soul's life so to speak um and so when we moved we moved wards we moved across sacramento um i remember talking to my mom about this actually and when we moved i asked her i was like so are we gonna go back to church are we gonna continue going to church she's like maybe I'm not quite sure. And then we never did. And I remember feeling, like I said, that loss, that loss of the community, but not necessarily the loss of the faith. And I, even, even after that, like very quickly after that, my mom um, started, like I mentioned before, <laughs> we probably paid Silver Raven Wolf's mortgage couple of months in a row because of all the books my mom bought um she tends to dive very heavily into faith paths um she goes gangbusters just goes all out and uh and that was the new thing we were no longer going to be participating with ward functions we were no longer tithing which is a big deal um if you don't tithe then you can't get some of the benefits of being in the ward. Like, should you need help? 
they they're like okay we're gonna help you but then you have to make sure you keep up with your tithes like you don't tithe then you're not in good standing with the church you can't get to temple you can't can't go on mission you know it's it, there's a lot of things and the church will actually like contact you going hey what's going on um and the, the tithe is pretty steep like you tithe 10 percent of your household income not like drop money in the basket no 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 you tithe 10 percent that the lds church is very prosperous um and if you don't they find out why so after that uh we were thrust into the craft because we were still young and i remember doing grove and stuff like that and doing ritual um i remember doing group rituals of of like beltane and Samhain and and mabon and and such like that and um there was no real emphasis on the path that the group as a collective was practicing we were just basically following a book kind of thing there were people of varying degrees in this in their practice but we were just basically practicing out of a book and it didn't connect to me like i would say my nightly prayers instead of you know now i lay me down to sleep it was now lady of the moon and and there was no face to god like there had been before it was just the lady and the the lord and the lady was now a goddess and the lord was now the god and then he transformed into the horned god and the 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 lady of the moon and then from there i actually started moving into a a, a path which was actually uh devoid of my craft entirely and it's it hasn't been until recently that they've become i guess one again but that's that's how i divorced myself from the lds church uh and it, it actually broke my heart when i found out that my mother um after i moved out went back to the church knowing having reconnected with her brother um She went back to the church during the whole yes on prop eight and then very publicly announced that she had voted yes on prop eight after she had performed a hand fasting type ceremony for my uncle and his partner. Um, and when I asked her why she did it, she said, because the church told her to. And my I don't, I don't get it. I don't know how you can reconcile that in your brain. And, and her reasoning was she didn't perform a marriage. She performed a, performed a joining. Um, which if anybody has done any ecclesiastical study knows that the Bible as we know it today, the King James or, you know, the Gideon, whatever you want to look at, that was all, everybody knows the Old Testament was, was uh, transcribed from the Torah by like 200 different freaking interpreters. And they are interpreting an interpretation. Like, who's to say that marriage is actually marriage in the original works? It's probably not. It's probably a joining. So, like, that just kind of devoid made it easier in my mind to just say, you know monotheistic faiths are probably not my thing especially if they're all based on a collective grouping or a collective of books that we don't even have the actual translations for that we don't have completed because things have been ripped out and and lost or kept from us or whatever as i as i tell people on amino i do not put faith in people because people will manipulate things to their own end. I think uh, we're well, touching on the subject when you're talking about how your mom voted in favor of Prop 8 because the church told her to. 
um, one of the things I really kind of came to realize is that <clears throat> over, I don't know, I want to say over the last five, six years, I didn't really get politically involved until uh, we got around to voting Obama into office for the first time. And I started getting a little bit more motivated to get involved with that. And then I started paying a lot more attention. And I, I think I've come to realize that I think people are much better defined as what kind of person they are by their politics rather than their religion. A religion, you can say you believe this, you hope the best for someone else, you can pray for them, but you don't get results like you do when you actually start voting. When you start voting and taking an active measure there, you are literally affecting the lives of people around you as opposed yeah. to just simply wishing them well and sending good thoughts and vibes. Um, so you get a lot better measure of a person based on how they vote and uh, what they're, what actions they're act actively taking that affect the people around them. Uh, something else you had brought up, too, was the whole tithing thing. And I, I remember that. I remember when our churches were doing that, too. And, uh, you know, it it's one of those things that doesn't really occur to you as a kid because you don't really have a concept of what money is as, as a child. You just understand, oh, hey, you know, I got an allowance. I could go buy a candy bar. I could go buy the game that I wanted. But you don't really understand the concept of money as uh, what it was intended to replace, which was a bartering system. And um, I think that's really important to note that because of money, because of capitalism and what our country is right now, um, it's really changed the nature of what Christians are in this day and age, of what conservative Christians are, because that's the majority of Christians. They tend to be conservative. There are ones that are liberal. They're, they're more mindset like I am. They, they lean left. But a lot of them, the ones that are the loudest are the ones that we see voting for Trump and MAGA. And I think it's really important to note that there's there's a lot of stuff there that they don't even realize about themselves. Um, one of my favorite verses in the Bible that I kind of had looked up a little while back, and I love throwing this one out there, was Matthew 6.24. And that's kind of what I was looking up right there, which is, you cannot serve God and mammon. I love that one because conservatism is all about conserving money. It's all about uh, trying to accumulate, all about supporting capitalism and you know free trade. and in that very act, you are you are voting for mammon. If you are trying to get rid of health care in order to save money, you're trying to get rid of child care, you're trying to get rid of support for the poor, you're trying to get rid of Social Security for the elderly, then you are serving mammon, which is, um, I think it was supposed to be sort of a demonic deity. Uh, I, I don't know which faith. it's. It, I think it might have been uh, like a Babylon uh, god, but I'm not sure. But that is the whole concept is that the, that was what mammon was used to describe. And most people these days that don't even realize it, you know, when they vote for politicians that are all about cutting those programs in order to, uh, it's because they don't want to spend money on the poor. They don't want to spend money on the sick and the elderly. They don't realize that they are violating that very specific tenet of their faith. And I thought that was kind of interesting, especially when you have, you know, televangelists on TV that are asking you to send them more money and more money, and more money. And you have churches that are going right. to tithe. And uh, it's, the, you know, who are they serving at that point? It's not who they think it is. Well, and it got even worse during during MAGA because of the popularity of the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That started, I mean, that's been around for a long time, but it, it Came more into focus when we learned that, oh well, Trump and his advisors, his cab people on his cabinet, are the ones that ascribe to the prosperity gospel. And yeah, it's it, it's such a a weird thing of well, the prosperity gospel is like a complete one eighty of what I'm not familiar with the gospel prosperity is. gospel. The, the prosperity gospel is what a lot of televangelists preach. So it's the, the concept of give me money for your salvation. Probably like the servants who had tenants from their Lord and master and they went out and made more money and then the master rewarded them. Right. That one. Okay. That parable. <sighs> it's yeah, it's similar in, in, in that, but it's, you know, they wrote a whole gospel wrapped around it. It's, it's very bizarre. Well, I mean, if, if if you guys, I mean, again, this is for those who, I know some of us, probably most of us, have, have looked into that 
thick book that everybody puts so much stock in. There's There are things in there that just boggle the mind. Like the whole parable of the Good Samaritan. The idea that a Samaritan, who was a person looked down on during that time from the culture of Sumeria could be a good person. That's the whole, it's not like be a good person, do this for others. No, it's a story about, it's a racial slur against a group of people that were so looked down upon. They thought they were um, raiders and marauders and, and look, some, one of them could actually be redeemed. Like there's stuff like that through the entire book. No, I mean, we'll not even get into the sexist part of it. Well, the, the, the Good Samaritan one was um, interesting because the concept was supposed to be that um, the Jews at that time thought they were better than their neighbors. And the Samaritans were one of the neighbors that they hated. They were constantly at war with. They were constantly fighting with. And the whole concept of that one was supposed to tell you that goodness is not found in who you are and where your culture was that it could be in somebody else who have a completely different culture. And it was supposed to be one of Jesus's ones to teach you to love your neighbor as yourself. And the problem is, is that it kind of gets thrown out the window in this day and age. It's not focused on because we don't love our neighbors. We're trying to build a wall with Mexico. We are constantly profiling people and telling them that they can't board the planes because they might be a risk just because they happen to be, they happen to look like they're Middle Eastern. And we've really lost sight of that. Um, it's but you know at least the Christian side of us have if because uh, they're so fearful of anyone that was different culture right. that's doesn't fit their All narrative of what about they, number they one. Well, I mean, I don't think a lot of. Go I ahead, Cliff. I'm sorry. I said it's all about number one, and that's oh, yeah. you know that was, like you said, that is the thing that a lot of Christians have lost sight of. Christ, you know, Christ was asked what was the most important commandment. What did he say? Love, Love the neighbor. neighbor. Mm-hmm. All other commandments don't matter. If you follow that one commandment, everything falls in line. And Every yeah. major religion around the world has that as their primary tenant. Mm-hmm. I, I find it funny too that the person that you know conservative Christians worship, he was a Jewish socialist who preached loving immigration, mm-hmm. loving your strangers, okay. taking care of the sick, taking care of the poor and the needy and the elderly. And all of those things are just kind of thrown out the window, like, oh, no, not my Jesus. My Jesus is gung-ho America and right. preaches love your guns. And my Jesus money. drives a big truck and is white. <laughs> Jesus was, was uh, my co-pilot, but we back crashed back. in the Andes, and I was forced to eat it. So. Well, I, I, think, I think what, I mean, and I, uh, first of all, for all of those who are watching or will be watching, we're not. I'm trying very hard. I'm trying very hard not to bash Christians. Uh, I'm that's not, not bashing. Our point. That's Christians not our point. I'm bashing people who are not understanding that Jesus wasn't white. Uh, I think I think one of our everybody here, everybody's gripe is that Christians are not Christ-like, and even though they claim to be Christ-like, they are not Christ-like. Um, I I do want to say that there are other faiths who are just as exclusionary, and who are just as bug nuts. I'm looking at you, Scientology. Um, <laughs> talk about aliens and planets, right? And hoarding wealth. Uh, I, I, every every path is going to have its drawbacks. Um, I think that's why I was a mystic for so long. I built my own path uh, just because it was it's it was easier to keep the good in and lock the bad out like you know uh when i my faith the faith that i built for myself you know i promised i was always going to help those who i could i was going to answer questions honestly if it was a direct question i was going to answer it to the best of my ability go out do good deeds so on and so forth if somebody needs healing i was going to heal them etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think what happens is with human nature, and this might be a psychology thing. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. I leave that up to Kayla. Uh, I think what happens is we latch onto those fantasies and those ideals, and we grip them so much that we basically wring everything else out of them. Um, 
and we just turn our backs on the things that are damaging. Like in the Mormon faith, <laughs> Mormon do not value their women. Let's put it that way. Uh, the reason that you they do not uh, allow birth control and why polygamy was a thing, even though the church will say it was never a thing, it was. Uh, sorry, airing out that dirty temple vestment. Um, is because their idea is that to conquer the world for their faith, they have to breed their faith. Mormon women are like drugged up all the goddamn time. You ask them, they're going to tell you no. Those women are on antidepressants and they flee as much as they can, but then they don't have any skills either. You know, they're, they're taught, they go to, to BYU to find a husband. They don't go to BYU to become a doctor. In fact, I had a friend who married in the temple and after a year of marriage, or I'm sorry, they got sealed in the temple. After a year of marriage, her husband left her because she wasn't Mormon enough because she wanted to have a career. And his mother pressured him to pressure her to give up her career. Mm. And they got divorced. Dang. That's like real Norman Bates right there. Mother said that that wasn't okay. I no. hate to do this, but I have to actually go. The dogs are whining. I have to feed them and take care of them. So I am going to have to bounce. It is almost 7, too. Oh. Um. Oh, it is. I have a family. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I mean, I enjoyed our conversation. Um, and I did, too. Like, the, I, I love hearing about everybody's journeys, to be perfectly honest. And, Eric, thank you so much for joining us and giving us this topic, by the way. Oh, it was a good one. Thanks for coming help. on. Um, hey, I get to work on a witchy podcast, but I'm not a witch, so, you know. <laughs> good luck, Eric. Cool, I right? mean... Uh, so we do have a guest next week for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Sid is going to be joining us. We will have more info on that later. Um, I love you guys. Uh, I love you And more. I wish I miss you guys. Um, I wish you guys a great week. I wish you guys a good week too. Bye, everyone. Bye.